Hello again. <clears throat> this is Steve, and uh, I'll be live streaming these text talks to you from Fairfield Seventh day Adventist Church's website. Right now, that's uh, still broadcasting from my home, but shortly we'll be broadcasting from the church. So, um, we're a small church located in Fairfield, Illinois. And we are dedicated to Christ's ministry of providing protection, promoting healing, and restoring confidence to wounded people of all sorts. It's a come-as-you-are church and a real church. So these talks <clears throat> um, are companion pieces to the Sabbath devotionals that you've been watching uh, either here or on my personal Facebook feed. Those, those devotionals don't spend a lot of time in the scripture, and yet I am a Christian. Um, I'm spiritual, but religious. And behind all of the thoughts and the worldview that I've been presenting in those devotionals is a study of the Bible. So in these text talks, we're just going to be dipping our toes into the Bible behind the thoughts. Um, but first of all, let me just kind of um, let you in on a secret, because when we talk about the Bible, we're really talking, um, you can't talk about the Bible without talking about how you manage the Bible. Okay, so before before I start talking about the how about the Bible behind my thoughts, let me first get these windows arranged so that I can see see my thoughts at the same time as we are talking, um, and uh, we'll go from there. So okay, um, this is called hermeneutics. Okay, that's a big college word. The basis basically means how do you interpret the Bible? How do you strive to understand the Bible? And um, what I use, the, patent, the method that I use is, is called by the college professors the historical grammatical method. Um, I'll be trying to understand what the Bible says by paying attention to the words and the grammar that are used just like you do if you're reading a letter or a text or an email. Okay. In addition, I'll be, be exploring what is known about the historical and cultural context within which the author of the words was writing. Just like you ex interpret an email or a letter within the context of what you know about the person's life and environment. But underlying this method is an assumption that uh, there is both a human and a divine element pres present in every passage in the Bible. A man who was talking or writing and a God who was communicating through the man. Now that concept is just hard to nail down as an idea Okay, just as hard as the concept that Jesus was both God and man at the same time. And so, of course, Christians have struggled with this concept as they have, have struggled with faith all through the centuries. The method that I'm using, the historical grammatical method, contrasts with several other methods that are common in Christianity today. The historical critical method only looks at the human side of the equation, uh, using literary and historical tools that were originally developed for studying ancient literature and have been refined in studying the Bible. It uses those tools to try to reconstruct what could have been the original text and the original meaning of the passage because it assumes that what we have today is not what was originally written. 
And it makes that assumption because of the evidence from manuscripts that shows differences in wording, differences in grammar, and changes over time. Now, my personal experience in life causes me to believe that there is more to the cosmos than just the physical and psychological realities that are readily available, uh, readily visible to us. Okay. So while I can empathize with the goals of the historical critical method and some of their observations, uh, the underlying assumption is something that I can't embrace and the rejection of divine communication is something that um, is not a part of my worldview. Now, in contrast to this historical critical method and the historical grammatical method, okay, is what is called the verbal inspiration method. Whereas the historical critical method assumes that there is no divine element in the Bible, the verbal inspiration method assumes that there is no human element. In essence, the writers of the Bible were just taking secretaries, taking down transcription, which was being dictated by God. While this approach appears to elevate the authority of scriptures and is held by many conservative Christians who believe in the Bible very strongly, it's not without its problems. Because the question then becomes, what words are divine? Even at the level of Hebrew and Greek, we're faced with variations in the manuscripts that we have. And the manuscripts that we have are not the original manuscripts. Which words are divine? And then when you add the complexity of translating from one language to another, the questions only multiply for me because I have lived in other cultures. I have tried to learn other languages. And I know that it's not a simple one-to-one -one matching up words process. Languages differ in the ideas that they communicate, in the perspective that they view life through. Another hermeneutical method, method of interpreting the scripture, uh, are the dispensational and, co and covenantial methods. These methods choose parts of the Bible to pay attention to and, and to apply to our lives and say that other parts do not apply either because they um, only applied during certain times in, in, in human history or they only apply to a certain portion of humanity, Jews, Gentiles, um, etc. Okay? Uh, this, is, uh, this simply makes some parts of the Bible relevant to, to Christians that use that method, and other parts of the Bible they ignore. So you find this, find this in people who, uh, who only read the writings of Paul, or who only read the New Testament, um, or who only read the Gospels. I don't find evidence in the Bible to support this breaking of the Bible into pieces. Um, so I'll be looking at passages throughout the Bible and treating them as being equally applicable to our lives. So there's some background on Steve. That's what goes on in between the ears. Um, and as in everything, I'm sharing my personal experience. I'm not an authority. I'm not even an authority within my church denomination. This is Steve sharing his perspective and his experience um, spiritually. So the question I want to deal with today, we've, we were talking about blind feet and the way that 
the paths that are mapped out for us to travel in this world uh, help us to overcome obstacles and avoid hazards. And I suggested that it was inconsistent for us as Christians to pick and choose from God's law and say that some parts of it apply to us and some parts don't. But that begs the question, how can Christians have a meaningful relationship with the law? And that's what I want to dip our toes into as we turn to the Bible. So before we start, I'd like to have prayer with you. Okay. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for promising that you would lead us. Thank you for promising that we could know you. Today, I ask you to make those promises come true in our lives. In Jesus' name, I pray and for his sake. Amen. Okay, so our quest is to find a meaningful relationship with the law. And the first first um, passage that I would like to take us to, let me grab a Bible here. Okay, I'm using the King James Version because that's what my mama made me memorize when I was a child, and that's the only version that I had available to me uh, when I was a young adult over in Indonesia. This was the only English book that I had, and I read it cover to cover many times. Um, so it's the version that is, sticks in my mind. You can use whatever version you want. I'm not going to be playing word games here. Uh, what we're seeking is an understanding of the word. And first of all, let's start with Psalms chapter 19. Bible software is perfectly uh, acceptable to me too. Uh, I'm using the old text version because I've got so many windows on my screens right now that adding another window just makes things too complex and confusing. Okay, so Matthew 19, 7 through 12. This is one of the passages that shapes my worldview and helps me to arrive at a meaningful relationship to the law. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than the honeycomb. I butchered the melody, I know, okay? But that scripture song drives the point home into my life. The law of the Lord is perfect. Do you throw away something that's perfect? Question that I had to face in my life, okay? And the choice that I made was to embrace the law. If the Bible says that the law is perfect, that God's communication of how we are to live our lives was perfect, everlasting, making wise the simple, I need that in my life. So Matthew 5, 17 through 20 is the second passage I want to point you to. Okay. Matthew chapter 5, 17 through 20. This is um, Matthew's uh, telling of what we call the Sermon on the Mount. It's his gathering together of Christ's teachings. Um, <clears throat> and one of the major things that he deals with is the law. And in verses 17 through 20, get to the right chapter here. Jesus said, Think not that I come to destroy the law or the prophets. I come not to destroy, but to fulfill. 
For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these the least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. For me, there are, there are several several points that, that stand out in, the, in what Jesus had to say there. Number one, he did not come to destroy the law. So if we say that Jesus came and did away with the law, we have to explain away this clear statement. He said he came to fulfill the law. Now, I've heard that explained as he came to live a perfect life, and therefore, because he fulfilled the law in his life, we don't have to. Which is just another way of saying that he destroyed the law. When you make a law not apply to the people it was given to, you just destroyed it, to my perception, okay? Um, heaven and earth are still here. So to my perception, Jesus was saying the law is always going to be with us because there's always going to be heaven and earth. In Matthew 22, 36 to 40, Jesus was talking and somebody tried to trip him up, somebody that was very intellectual and thought he had a good question that a teacher would have difficulty answering. Um, and a lawyer, a specialist in word twisting, asked him a question, tempting him, saying, Master, which is the great commandment of the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. How does that shape my worldview? Psalms says that the law is perfect. Matthew says that Jesus did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And here in Matthew 22, Jesus says that if you want to paraphrase the law, it only takes two statements. Love God and love your fellow man like you love yourself. I found those powerful. I call those the prime directives. Okay? The prime directives of the law are that you love God with all your heart and that you love your fellow men as you love yourself, which assumes that you love yourself and actually mandates that you love yourself. For me, it makes such a difference in my life when those are the stars that I orient myself to as I navigate through life. I find the law very meaningful when I look at it from that perspective. John chapter 15, 10. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. Sorry, that's not the passage that I was wanting to share with you.
Okay, I know it's in John, and I know it's close around there. Okay, um, I'll put it in a comment at at the end of the the sermon. But the passage I was wanting to share with you was was the passage where Jesus says, "If you love me, keep my commandments." Jesus tied loving him to keeping his commandments to obeying him. And while some Christians who use the dispensational method therefore arrive at the idea that the only commandments of Jesus exist in the New Testament, when we take the Bible as a whole and we take what Paul says about Jesus being at Sinai and being with the children of Israel during the Exodus, and we take what Jesus had to say about him being being with Abraham, it suggests that the entire law of the Old Testament is part of the commandments of Jesus. Which means that the Ten Commandments are the commandments of Jesus. And really, if we think of God as being the same yesterday, today, and forever, it really doesn't make sense for him to have a certain set of rules in one for one epoch in human history and another set of rules for another epoch. Because Christians who say that the Old Testament law doesn't apply to them then turn right back around and find nine of those laws in the New Testament and assert that they are still valid because they're expressed in the New Testament. Um, I, I don't find that meaning a, a way to meaningfully relate to the law. It feels like sophistry, um, twisted arguments. Okay? And I'm not, I'm not accusing people of, of being evil here. Okay? This is something that has grown out of our struggles to find a meaningful relationship with the law and to understand the relationship between law and grace. Okay. This is my personal synthesis and pass and, and approach. I think I find that loving Jesus means that I obey him. And since I perceive the Ten Commandments of being a part of that obedience, I take them seriously and as applying to my life. Finally, Revelation 14.12. If you know anything about Seventh-day Adventists, you know that Revelation 14 is a key passage for us. We view it as encapsulating God's final message to humankind before he wraps up this whole struggle over sin and eradicates sin from the universe permanently. Okay. Essentially, this is his last message to us to, to try to rescue as many of us as he can before he wipes sin out and recreates heaven and earth for the happy ever after. And this is the description of the people who accept this message. Revelation 14 and verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. The grammar here could also also cause this to be read. Here is what causes the saints to be patient. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Revelation describes the people, the last day people as being commandment keepers. So let me just encapsulate my worldview here a little bit using these, these texts as touchstones. These do not prove my point. They simply serve to illustrate why, this, why I find a meaningful relationship with the law. I view the law as being good, not evil. I view it as being a gift to mankind, not a burden. Jesus didn't come to destroy the law. He came to fulfill it, not only in his life, but in my life and in yours. Imagine the difference it would make if we lived in a world where no one murdered, no one stole, no one lied. You didn't have to 
fear that people would cheat you either economically or in relationships? And where your life wasn't consumed with survival? Where every week you got to take time and put your trust into God, trust in God, into practical application by resting and letting go of the burden of work. The law is about love, loving God and loving our fellow men. That is not a burden. That is not evil. That is not something that I do to try to earn my salvation. It has nothing to do with earning salvation or fixing the sin problem, except that it describes the life of people who accept God's gift of salvation. If we love Jesus, we will keep his commandments. And in the end, it's the people who love Jesus enough to keep his commandments and who share in his faith in God who will make it through to the end. Thanks for joining me for Text Talk today. I'll see you next week.